We can expect an unimaginable time of trouble in the last days, such as the world has never seen before. That's what Scripture tells us. But we need not be afraid. His word shaping our story. The year was August 1948, and a young preacher, George Vandeman, was preparing to take the pulpit. As he did so, a Sabbath hush fell over the new grounds as members mixed gratitude with happy hearts for the work accomplished and for their new auditorium. That was 70 years ago, and Central California Conference continues the legacy of Soquel Camp Meeting today. Soquel, an embodiment of America's camp meeting, has become a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture, pleasure bursting with praise, and truth uniting with tradition. It is camp meeting time once again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Creator together and let our stories and the stories that are yet to come be shaped yet again. Early in his career, Dr. John Pauline was a church pastor in New York and Michigan. After teaching at the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary at Andrews University for many years, he came to Loma Linda University in 2007 as Dean of the newly formed School of Religion. Dr. Pauline is a well-respected biblical scholar and a prolific writer. He has written dozens of book reviews and has been published on topics relating to the history of the Adventist Church and the Book of Revelation. He is a specialist in the Johannine literature in the New Testament, Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, and the intersection of faith with contemporary culture. Dr. John Pauline received his bachelor's degree in theology from Atlantic Union College, which included a year abroad studying in West Germany. He achieved his MDiv degree in 1975 and his PhD in New Testament in 1987 from Andrews University. Outside of academia, Dr. Pauline enjoys being with his wife, Pamela, and their three children, and also enjoys travel, golf, and photography when time permits. Please welcome Dr. John Pauline. Good morning. Don't you love island music? I mean, that is just such good stuff. Uh, really enjoyed that, really appreciate it. His word, shaping our story. What a great title. I'm just loving it. And uh, what it uh, caused me to do is to ask the question, as we go through chapters in the book of Revelation, what difference do they make? How can they shape my story? How can they shape your story? And so we've been looking at chapter 12 yesterday morning and uh, particularly focused on the character of God. Last night we talked about chapter 13 and uh, focused on the great end time deception and how we can be more prepared for that. And today we're looking at chapter 14. And the chapter 14 in particular, the title I have here is The Last Sabbath. Because as you may know, uh, Seventh-day Adventists have often taught that the central issue in the final crisis of Earth's history is the Sabbath. And that's an interesting claim because the word Sabbath doesn't appear in the book of Revelation. So how do you get the central issue being the Sabbath when the word itself isn't there. We're going to do that this morning. And we're going to ask, what difference does it make? How does believing in the Sabbath, how does living the Sabbath in the end time shape our story? What can that do to help us to be ready for the things that are coming and help others to be ready as well? Many of you have come up to me uh, afterward last night we're asking more material on Revelation how do you get the big picture and uh, once again just uh, we have our Adventist Book Center those of you that are here uh, they are well stocked with these materials just ask them so Revelation 14 we learned last night that the basic reality of Revelation is that there will be a great end time deception and because of that end time deception, we need to be ready. But there's something that's not quite so clear. We know that there's going to be a deception, 
but exactly what the crucial issue is, that is not yet clear. And that's what I want to talk about with you this morning. Now, I said to you yesterday morning, I want to share some of my secrets. I want you to be able to understand the scriptures the way I've been privileged to understand them nearly 40 years now as a professional studying the book of Revelation, maybe two or three hours a day over that time. You do learn a few things over time, but there are methods that I've learned that can make a difference in how you read Revelation. And if you can understand Revelation, you can understand any part of the Bible, I would think. So basic principle, <clears throat> the book of Revelation is based on the Old Testament. Not everybody who's written a commentary on Revelation has drawn that conclusion. But I think if you read the book of Revelation with the Old Testament in mind, it makes all the difference. Revelation is built from the language, the ideas, the people, and the places of the Old Testament. As you are reading your way through, you want to be asking yourself, where is this in the Old Testament? How is this structured there? But there's a problem, a big problem. And that problem is Revelation never quotes the Old Testament. It's full of the Old Testament, but never quotes. It only alludes. What do we mean, alludes? It's when somebody gives a word or a phrase, and everybody knows what you're talking about. I'll give you one example. It's, it's maybe not so popular today with the younger generation, but most of my life we've talked about lemons, okay? What is a lemon? Well, it's a fruit, obviously, but what's the metaphor? I bought a lemon. You're talking about a car, right? A new car that doesn't work the way it's supposed to, a lemon. All right, now, I didn't quote anything. That all came from a book by Ralph Nader about 50 years ago, What to Do with Your Bad Car. And the book had a white cover, and there's this beautiful yellow lemon on the cover with four little plastic wheels. What to do with your bad car. That book made such an impact that from that time on, a car that doesn't work right is a lemon. All right, that's an illusion. You don't even need to know where that came from. Illusion is just with a word, with a phrase, with a name, in just the right tone of voice. And everybody knows what you're talking about. That's how the book of Revelation uses the Old Testament. And that's a problem, not for those who first heard it, but for those who read it today. That's the challenge. What exactly is the background of this text? How do you know when John intends to allude to the Old Testament? How do you know when the book of Revelation is pointing you to Isaiah, to Genesis, to Daniel, to Ezekiel, to Jeremiah, to the Psalms? How do you know? I want to share that secret with you today. A basic strategy is you can start with Bible margins. Everybody know what a Bible margin is? Many Bibles will have either down the middle, if you have uh, two texts on the page, or on the side or on the bottom, and it will give you alternate texts. So for Revelation 12, 11, you might have five or six texts there in the Old Testament. So with a Bible margin, you can see Here's some possibilities as to what might be going on in John's mind. Commentaries can suggest all kinds of things. And you look for three things, verbal, thematic, and structural parallels. All right, don't worry about that just yet. I'll explain those in more detail just a little bit later. But the bottom line is to ask the question, 
Am I dealing with an illusion or an echo? When I talk to you about lemon, that's an echo. I wasn't telling you, you got to go read Ralph Nader's book, okay? I was echoing what I picked up from Ralph Nader and what many people have picked up, but I was just touching base with something I thought you knew. And with that one word to bring a whole background into play, that's an echo. An illusion is where I want you to go back to a specific earlier speech. For example, four score and seven years ago. What's that? Abraham Lincoln, Gettysburg Address. All right, 90% of you at least knew that immediately. All right, that's an illusion. I could have said 87 years, and you wouldn't be sure, right? 87 years ago. Yeah, but four score and seven years ago. That choice of language immediately connects back to what Abraham Lincoln said 150 years ago, a little bit more even today. Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was white as snow. Can you f finish it? Right. You know that one, right? So illusion is where an author deliberately uses words. One could even say, fleece white as snow. And some people would, would pick up an allusion to that. So illusion is where you use a word, a phrase, or something, and you want the reader to connect with a specific background text that will expand what you are saying. With that one word or that one phrase, you can bring a thousand words into play. It makes for a very rich text. And the book of Revelation is full of that. And so when you can figure out where John is alluding, it will bring additional insight into the text of Revelation. All right, let me give you an example. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and upon his horns ten royal crowns. You're familiar with this guy, right? We talked about him last night. Upon his heads, the names of blasphemy, the beast I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. All right, does verse 2 ring a bell with anyone? Okay. Daniel 7, right? You have a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Okay, so let's highlight that. You can see that there's a number of interesting things here. You have a beast coming up out of the sea, Daniel 7, ten horns and seven heads, leopard, bear, lion. All right? And Daniel 7 describes four animals. You have a lion, a bear, a leopard, and we'll call him a bizarre beast, all right? Really weird, really strange animal, all right? So you have these four animals in Daniel 7. Now think heads for a minute. How many heads does the lion of Daniel 7 have? One head. What about the bear? One head. What about the leopard? Four heads. What about Mr. Bizarro? One head. All right. Let's do the math. One plus one plus four plus one equals what? Seven. All right. The four beasts of Daniel 7 have a total of seven heads. All right. So let's go back. Let's think horns. How many horns did the lion have? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something, <laughs> a lion with horns, all right? How about the bear? Yeah, that would also be funny. How about the leopard? That would be funny too. But Mr. Bizarro, he's got all ten, all right? So once again, doing the math, you have zero, zero, zero plus ten equals ten. So the four beasts of Daniel 7 have a total of 10 horns. So what's going on in Revelation 13? You have one animal with the characteristics of all four in Daniel 7. It's a composite beast. 
It's a beast that's bringing together the characteristics of all four. You could say it's the pedigree of the sea beast. Remember I told you that when a new character comes into play in the book of Revelation, you get first a visual. Here you see it. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea having ten horns, seven heads, ten royal crowns upon his heads. The name of blasphemy was like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. That's a visual description. So John's freeze frame for the sea beast, here you have the visual description. And by the way, the beast is coming out of the sea. What's the first thing you would see if the beast is coming out of the water? The horns, right? And the next thing would be the head, and then you'd see the body, and then you'd see the feet, and then maybe your eyes would go back to the mouth if, if it's roaring, and that's exactly the order that you have here. This beast is being described as if it is coming out of the sea. And you see more and more of it uh, as it comes out. So Revelation 13 is bringing together a whole bunch of things from Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, they come out of the sea. You have a lion, a bear, a leopard. There's seven total heads and 10 total horns. And then in Revelation 13, comes out of the sea, lion, bear, leopard, seven heads, 10 horns. All right? Is John alluding to Daniel 7 in Revelation 13? Of course. There's really no other conclusion you can draw because the evidence is overwhelming that John intended this connection between the two. So when you're studying Revelation 13, you need to have Daniel 7 in mind. By the way, there was a great scholar in England. His name was C.H. Dodd. Previous generation, he flourished maybe in the 40s and 50s of the previous century. And C.H. Dodd studied all the quotations of the Old Testament in the New. Now, you're stuck with me on this. This is my doctoral dissertation was on the use of the Old Testament in Revelation, okay? So you're stuck with me right now, something I have a passion for. But C.H. Dodd said, when New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, they don't do it for proof texts. In other words, they're not saying, all right, to prove what I'm saying here, look at this quote. Sometimes what they quote has nothing to do with the text. Have you ever noticed that? What they quote doesn't seem to have anything to do, but it's a pointer, said Dodd, to the entire context. He gives you one snippet of the Old Testament, maybe a few things like this, but he wants you to remember the whole context of Daniel 7 is relevant to what's happening in Revelation 13. All right. That's a whole nother big subject, but we're touching on it here. In Revelation 13, the evidence is clear. But what do you do when the evidence is less clear? That's the big question in study of the book of Revelation. You look for three pieces of evidence. So when you're reading Revelation 13 and you're reading Daniel 7, how do you come to the conclusion that those two texts are connected. You look, first of all, for verbal parallels, words, big words that the two have in common, like lion, bear, leopard. These are major words the two texts have in common. You won't find those three, I think, anywhere else in the Bible. You look for thematic parallels, where there's ideas in common, animals coming up out of the water, that's a common theme. And then structural parallels. Structural parallels are where an author structures his text to follow an earlier text. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done a Sabbath school lesson? As a teacher, you're following the structure of the lesson as you present it to a class and as you ask questions. That would be a structural parallel. 
All right, so you look for three pieces of evidence. Verbal parallels, at least two major words in common between two texts, all right? Two major words, the more the better. The difference between an illusion and a quotation, an illusion works with two or three words. A quotation, you need to have a dozen or more words. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. That's a quotation, all right? So the more words, the more certain you are of the background. In Revelation 13, you have sea, lion, bear, leopard, heads and horns, six words in common. That's a strong verbal parallel. If you have six major words in common, in Revelation, that almost never happens. There's one place, I think, where Revelation 10 has eight words in common with Daniel 12. That's the strongest connection between Revelation and the Old Testament in the book. All right, thematic parallels, a clear parallel of ideas. By itself, this is the weakest evidence, by itself, because it's just ideas. It's when you have solid words and solid structures that you're a little more confident. In Revelation 13, you have animals coming up from the sea, representing world powers. That's a theme in common with Revelation 13. All right, and then structural parallels, where you have a number of words and themes in roughly the same order. Now, all this sounds a little bit complicated, but we're gonna illustrate it for you in a moment. All right, so it'll get a little bit simpler. And I'll just tell you a secret. If you really wanna know your Bible and you master this idea, of looking for allusions, etc. If you do it for 20 to 50 hours, somewhere in there, the light is going to come on, and you'll suddenly begin to feel what the Bible writer is doing. It'll be a totally different thing than you've ever experienced before, and you will learn from the Bible. I've had pastors, hundreds and hundreds of pastors in my career, study these methods. And then I send them home and say, okay, now you, you pick a text in Revelation and you do this. And somewhere before the quarter is over, you'll see them come in with eyes shining and they'll say, I learned from the Bible for the first time. Because pastors often read books, very helpful books that talk about the Bible, work stuff together, that's very, very good. But when you learn from the Bible yourself, there's nothing more thrilling than that. The Word of God making itself known to you personally. Wow, that's exciting. So this is a little bit complicated for the moment. But if you master this, and there's resources that uh, you can go deeper on this if you want to, but if you master this, it will change everything because the Bible will now open itself to you directly with the help of the Holy Spirit. Structural parallels are very strong evidence. In Revelation 13, you have many words and themes of Daniel 7 all clustered together. And Daniel 7 is frequently a point of reference in Revelation, in other words, in chapter 1 of Revelation, Daniel 7's in the background. In chapters 4 and 5, Daniel 7's in the background. Chapter 13, chapter 17, Daniel 7 is in the background. Chapter 12, Daniel 7's in the background. So for the author of Revelation, Daniel 7 is a crucial text over and over and over again. That means whenever you see words like lion, bear, and leopard, you're pretty sure he's talking about Daniel 7. All right, that's how structural parallels work. And here you can see the details of the structural parallel between Revelation 13 and Daniel 7. Okay, so that's the background work. Now for the topic of today, where's the Sabbath in the book of Revelation? Let's start with our foundation text. The dragon was angry with the woman and he went away to make war with the remnant of her seed 
those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. You remember we looked at that last night, and we had this conflict between the dragon and the remnant. And you may remember, we saw Revelation 12, 13, and 14. Revelation 12, 17 is a nutshell summary in advance of chapters 13 and 14. Chapter 13, the dragon's war. He gets his allies, the counterfeit trinity. Chapter 14, the remnant's response. So chapter 14 is the God side of this end time conflict. And we don't have time to do the whole chapter, but I want to zero in on what I think is the most decisive part. Let me give you a little side piece. In my understanding, the book of Revelation is structured like a pyramid. The first part of the book is parallel to the last part. And if we had five hours, I could show you in detail how this works. I'm not making this up. The first part parallels the last part. The seven churches parallels the New Jerusalem. Uh, the seals parallel the material in chapters 19 and 20. The trumpets parallel the bowls. And then the high point is in the middle. The center of the book of Revelation is chapters 12 to 14. Now, there's a Roman Catholic scholar named Elizabeth Fiorenza, someone I know personally. She's not a Seventh-day Adventist. She's not influenced at all by the work that I've done on this subject. She wrote before I did my work in this subject. But she came to the same conclusion that the book of Revelation was structured as a pyramid. And she said, in this pyramid structure, where do you think the emphasis is? It's on the center. The emphasis is on the center. It's not like Western logic. We would say A plus B equals C. All right, we're heading somewhere. The climax is the end of the book. But here you have a structure that's A plus B equals A. And the focus is on the middle. That's Hebrew thinking. It's a little bit different from Western thinking. Now, Fiorenza takes it a step further. She says, I believe that there's a center of the center in the book of Revelation. You know what she thought that was? The three angels' messages. Now, I don't agree with everything my Catholic scholar friends say. But when a Catholic scholar is right, I want to agree, don't you? The center of the center is the three angels' messages. Now, I want to take it one step further. I believe that there's a center of the center of the center of the book of Revelation, and that is the most decisive text in the entire book. But I'm going to let you think about that for a moment. We'll come back to it, okay? I believe that the center of the center of the center is going to show itself here. But let's start with the counterfeit trinity. You have a counterfeit, the dragon counterfeits God the Father, the sea beast counterfeits God the Son, and the land beast counterfeits God the Holy Spirit. All right? And you have in the book of Revelation, in chapter 13, you have this unholy trinity. And in chapter 14, you have the remnant. And in these two chapters, what is the dynamic? It is an attack on the remnant. The final crisis of Earth's history will have a great attack on the people of God at the end. But this attack will be by deception as much as by force. And what will be the key to understanding that deception? I believe the center of the center of the center is chapter 14, verse 7. And let me show you why. Fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him 
who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. So here you have, as part of the first angel's message, a call to worship God. Now, I highlight the word worship there in red for a reason, because I think worship is the key word in the center of Revelation. Let's see. Let's take a look. Revelation 13 and 14 leave us in no doubt what the basic issue in that attack is. Chapter 13, verse 4, they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, verse 8, everyone who lives on the earth will worship him. Verse 12, he will cause the earth and those who live in it to worship the first beast. Verse 15, in order that the image of the beast might speak and might cause anyone who does not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Take a look here. How many times is the word worship in chapter 13? Five times. And it's always talking about the enemy. Worship the dragon. Worship the beast. Worship the image of the beast. Continue. Chapter 14, verse 9. If anyone worships the beast and his image. 1411. Those who worship the beast and his image. We've been doing some math today. How many times does the word worship appear in 13 and 14? Seven times referring to the dragon, the beast, or the image of the beast. Seven times in chapters 13 and 14. Clearly, the issue at the end is worship, what you think of God. Seven times worshiping the beast. One time there's a call to worship God. What would you draw from that? What I draw from that is that one time, Revelation 14, 7 must be the most important text of all. It's the center of the center of the center, the call to worship God. In contrast, with the sevenfold call to worship the beast and his image. Fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. This is the central appeal in the entire book of Revelation. This is the most decisive text to master if you want to understand the issue in the final crisis. So what is that issue? Very interesting. We're talking about illusions. I believe that there's an illusion in this text to the fourth commandment in Exodus. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Take a look. Revelation 14, 7, worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. Exodus 20, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. Do you see that? A powerful verbal parallel between Revelation 14 and Exodus 20, verse 11. The message of the remnant, at the very center point of the book of Revelation, there's a direct allusion to the fourth commandment. You can't understand Revelation unless you understand the Old Testament background to this text. The ideal response to the sevenfold call to worship the unholy trinity is what? To worship the true God on his day. That's the central piece of the message 
of the book of Revelation. The ideal response to God's final call to worship is to remember him on his day. But you know, this study got posted on the internet. You know what happens on the internet? You get naysayers, okay? You get people who push back. And you know what? I like it because I learned something. When somebody's passionate about a subject and they passionately believe something different than what you do, they can point out flaws in what you're thinking. They can cause you to go back and relook at it and see things you'd missed before and maybe make it even stronger than it ever was before. Well, this happened. The objection came along. Wait a minute. Are you sure that Revelation 14, 7 is actually alluding to the fourth commandment? What about Psalm 146? Could it be alluding to Psalm 146 in verse 6? Well, I took a look, <laughs> and it's true. Psalm 146, 6 has the same phrase as Exodus 20, 11. Uh-oh. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Psalm 146, 6. The maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. Hmm. Huh. So what is it? Is he alluding to the fourth commandment or is he alluding to Psalm 146? What do you do when things are not so clear? You go back to basics. And I want to illustrate for you how uh, this methodology works. Take a look, three-way comparison. Revelation 14, worship him who made heaven, earth, and sea. Exodus 20, in six days the Lord made heavens, the earth, the sea. Psalm 146, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. So there's a strong parallel between all three of these texts. So what are we going to say? Let's take a look at the verbal parallels. I would say the verbal parallels are both strong. But here's the interesting thing. If you go to the Greek of Psalm 146, and compare it with the Greek of Revelation 14, 7, they're identical. There's a stronger verbal parallel to Psalm 146 than to Exodus 20. Uh-oh. Have I been misleading you here? Okay, let's keep looking. That's not all. Thematic parallels. The motivations of the first table of the law the Ten Commandments are God's invitation to live a life according to his will. But God knows that we're weak, and so he puts motivations in there. The motivation of salvation. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, therefore have no other gods before me. You know, nobody else brought you out of Egypt, so stick with me. All right? There's the motivation of judgment, second commandment, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children into the third and fourth generation. Remember that one? Motivation of judgment. In a sense, you have the carrot and the stick. We sometimes need both because we're like little children before the Lord. All right? And then the motivation of creation. God made you. He did the manual, you know? the owner's manual. Following the owner's manual is the healthiest thing, the happiest thing that you could possibly do. So the motivations of the first table of the law are salvation, judgment, and creation. Take a look at Revelation 14. I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven having what? The everlasting gospel. Does that sound like salvation? Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea. You see, you have thematic parallels here. Out of the house of bondage, the motivation of salvation, visiting the iniquity, the motivation of judgment, 
for in six days the motivation of creation revelation 14 the everlasting gospel the hour of his judgment him who made so there's three strong thematic parallels between revelation 14 and exodus 20. sounding good three common themes salvation judgment creation but before you get too comfortable these same three themes are in psalm 146 as well do not put your trust in princes and mortal men who cannot save blessed is he whose help is in the god of jacob whose hope is in the lord is god the maker of heaven and earth he upholds the cause of the oppressed there they are the motivations of salvation of creation and of judgment so the thematic parallels to both old testament passages are strong but this time there's a slight edge to exodus 20 because in revelation the motivations are in the same order as in the commandments in psalm 146 they're not so there's an edge to exodus 20 this time so we're basically at a tie right this is the world cup of biblical exegesis which text is going to win all right we got one period left to play and that's the structural parallels are there structural parallels to the commandments around revelation 14 yes there are it speaks of the commandments of god revelation 12 17 revelation 14 12. it talks about worship and the first four commandments especially are all about worship worship the beast worship his image blasphemy mark of the beast you notice something about those four those are counterfeits of the first four commandments worship the beast first commandment worship the image second commandment blasphemy third commandment you know take the name of the lord in vain mark of the beast opposed to the seal of god the sabbath the beast deliberately counterfeits the first four commandments in chapter 13. so you have a strong structural parallel between revelation 14 and exodus 20. the first table of the law is strongly behind revelation 12 13 and 14. so let's weigh the evidence in terms of verbal parallels to exodus 20 they are strong to psalm 146 they're very strong thematic parallels to exodus 20 they're very strong to psalm 146 they're strong structural parallels to exodus 20 very strong psalm 146 none For whatever reason the author of revelation does not seem interested in psalm 146. he uses the language of psalm 146 because psalm 146 was quoting exodus 20. they are a parallel within the old testament and when the author of revelation alludes to the fourth commandment he naturally is going to use the language of psalm 146 as well but there's no evidence anywhere in revelation that psalm 146 is of particular interest to him so in the very center of the book of revelation the crucial central point is an allusion to the fourth commandment in other words yes folk the sabbath is a crucial issue in the final crisis and the question i want to ask as we close how does that shape our story you know simply because you worship on saturday rather than sunday is that all that important does that make all that difference does that change the world 
by itself? How does it shape our story? What can it tell us that really does make a difference? I'd like to suggest a number of things. First of all, the Sabbath is a reminder of creation. And what does creation tell us about God? It tells us that God is a lover of freedom. When he created us, he created us free to make choices. He created us free to create. We can create little people in our own image. Think about that. God's self-sacrifice, he gave up the right to make many decisions about who's going to come into this world. That's incredible. A God of love and a God of freedom, all of that is found in the creation story, and the Sabbath reminds us of creation. It reminds us of the Exodus. In Deuteronomy 5, the Ten Commandments are repeated, but this time the Sabbath recalls the Exodus. God loves freedom, and when his people were slaves, he doesn't want people to be slaves. Is it possible for a person to be a religious slave today? To obey God only because you're told to do so? To obey God only because there's a reward if you do and punishment if you don't? Would you want your children to be slaves? Or would you want them to grow up to be adults who can be your best friends? I, I'm just absolutely amazed. My kids are now in their 30s, and they're my best friends. It's amazing. It's wonderful. You know? It's absolutely incredible. When they grow up to be adults and they have a mind of their own, you now engage each other on an equal level. It's really, really cool. And so the Exodus story is about a God who's passionate for our freedom and for our salvation. The Sabbath is a pointer to the cross, because remember, Jesus died on Good Friday. He rose on Easter Sunday and rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. You know, he could have come up Friday night. The point would have been made but he chose to rest on the Sabbath because that day mattered. And at the cross, we see the incredible self-sacrificing love of God. It's also a pointer to the end, Hebrews 4. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In eternity, every day will be Sabbath. It will be the Sabbath of the whole human experience. And so the Sabbath is significant because God has built into the Sabbath reminders of himself. When you truly understand the Sabbath day, you encounter a God of love, a God of freedom, a God of grace, a God of mercy, and I personally need to hear that every day, don't you? And the Sabbath is a wonderful way to demonstrate our trust in God. Yeah, you know, Saturday and Sunday, there's no difference. Sun shines on Saturday, shines on Sunday. Rains on Saturday, rains on Sunday. Astronauts circling the earth can't see any difference between those two days. So in a sense, it was a choice on God's part that this day, because it came at the conclusion of creation. This day would memorialize my mighty acts on this earth. That was God's choice. And it's our choice when we trust in him to meet him on the day. And you know, it's the right thing to do. Because if I say to my wife, let's go for a date on Tuesday. We're going to go out to our favorite restaurant and uh, have some special time together. And I suddenly decide, no, I think I'll do it on Wednesday instead. And she shows up on Tuesday and I'm not there. Happy camper? Not likely, you see. When you're in relationship, and it's a relationship of trust and a relationship of a desire to please one another, what that person wants become what you want as well. You do it not because you have to. You do it because you want to. 
And that's the ideal, that's the kind of obedience that God longs for. Shall we pray as we close? Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Sabbath. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for humanity. The Sabbath was a gift. It wasn't torture. It wasn't so much a test. The Sabbath is a gift. On that day, we can rejoice in the trust we have in God. On that day, we're not obligated to work, to earn money, to do all the things we otherwise do. It is a day for us to enjoy with God and with each other. And we thank you, Lord, for that gift. We pray that as we draw near the close of the conflict, you will become ever more the center. And as we meet you every week on that Sabbath day, we are bearing witness to our trust in you, that you are truly trustworthy, worthy of our trust and worthy of our love. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. We would like to thank the constituency of the Central California Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for making this program possible and from viewers just like you. Thank you.